Welcome to the 8th grade project presentations of the class of 2020. These young women and men have worked very hard all throughout the entire school year studying a subject of their choice and today they are here to present to you their project presentations. Thank you. For my 8th grade project, I chose food from international countries. I first made a sign up genius to give people the option to cook with me. Once most people had signed up, we either decided to cook at their house or mine from their country of origin. Overall, I cooked food from 13 different countries from around the world. I also apologize if I mispronounce any words. For Colombia, I cooked with Carolina and we cooked arepas and plantains. My favorite thing about cooking this dish was making the arepas and trying to get them perfectly smooth without any cracks. Here's a recipe for the arepas and for the platanos fritos. For Canada, my mentor was Miss Colleen and we cooked butter tarts. I enjoyed making the shell of the tart the most and it was a treat to cook with my former kindergarten teacher. Here's a recipe for the tarts and for the tart filling. For Bulgaria, I cooked with Sveti and we made Vanitsa. The thing I enjoyed most about this recipe was layering the phyllo dough and eating this dish for breakfast because it was really good. Here's the recipe for the vanitsa. For Japan, I cooked with Miss Summer and we made okonomiyaki, which is a Japanese pancake. What was the most interesting thing about this dish was how slimy the nakiyama was as shown in this video. And there's the cooked pancake and the recipe for the okonomiyaki. For Germany, I cooked with Natalie and we made German chicken fricassee in Rotkreuz. The thing that I enjoyed the most was chopping up all of the different vegetables. Here's the recipe for the German chicken fricassee. fricassee. And their root groups. For Kenya, I cooked with Miss Sony and we made ukimo and mandazi. My most liked part of cooking these things was definitely making the mandazi and getting to fry the bread. Recipe for ukimo and mandazi. For Lao, I cooked with umpai and we made tom sum. The part that I liked the best in this recipe was how there were so many different foods that all came together into one meal. Also, Ms. Udumsug helped me make custard from La. Here's the recipe for the Thompson and for the custard. For Nepal, I cooked with Sudarshan and we made curry. What I thought was the coolest thing about this recipe was a pot that he used that would blow out steam while the food was cooking. And here is a quick video of him cutting vegetables. And here's the pot that blew the steam out. Here's the recipe for the curry. For Poland, I cooked with Bozena and Adam, and we made Nelishniki. My favorite part about cooking the Nelishniki was certainly flipping the pancake part of it because it is so big. And here's the recipe for the Nelishniki. For Sri Lanka, I cooked with Nalan and we made chicken curry. I liked how this recipe was spicy and how there was a lot of seasoning that was added to it to make a delicious flavor. And here's the recipe for the chicken curry. 
For India, I cooked with Vadula and we made Pavabahi. The best part of cooking this was chopping the vegetables, but most of all, eating it. And here's the recipe. For Taiwan, I cooked with Jason and we made dumplings. My favorite part was definitely folding the dumplings and seeing who got the most folds out of everyone, and also playing fun games with Jason and everyone. Here's the recipe for the dumplings. For Ghana, I cooked with Charlene, and we made jollof rice. When making jollof rice, I most enjoyed blunting the ingredients together, and then, of course, eating the finished result, as shown here. Here's the recipe for the jollof rice. I very much enjoyed my project. It was a great experience. Thank you to my mentors, Carolina Castanio Luisa, Mathani Corey Kastner, Umpai and Emily Udomsuk, Nalan Jayasena, Jason Yu Chung, Sadi Karubina, Vidula Kale, Buzena and Adam Wadumski, Sudarshan Pandi, Natsuko Dyer, Colleen St. John, Natalie Royce, and Charlene Agame. Also, thank you to Angelica Castanio, Omi Jayasena, Oli Udomsuk, Tom Royce, Jackson Cornwall, and Evan Cornwall for helping. And now, I have a short video of my mentors and I saying goodbye in different languages. Adios! Cincinnati Fire Department. Now to become a firefighter, you first must understand the origin of firefighting. On December 7, 1736, Benjamin Franklin established the Union Fire Company in Philadelphia. The U.S. didn't have fire government ran fire departments until around the time of the American Civil War. 1648, Peter Stuyvesant approved four men to act as fire wardens. They had to inspect all chimneys and to find any violators of the rules. If a fire was seen, the wardens would spin a big wooden rattle that directed the responding people to form bucket brigades. After a fire was put out, alarm drops would occur. Alarm drops would be when multiple companies would fight to be paid after a fire was put out. The first company to arrive would be paid even though other companies are helping. This is also how the term first in was invented. Sometimes firefighters would fight themselves to be paid. Now here's some general facts about firefighting. Firefighters work every third day, not including holidays. Firefighters work 106 to 108 days, and uniforms are supplied by the government. Vets are now bulletproof because a firefighter was grazed by a stray bullet. Each firehouse must have heat, air, and electric. All of their money comes from taxes people pay. There are 26 stations in a city and only 12 truck companies. Cincinnati's fire department was the first one to be fully paid and it had the first steam engine. Uncle Joe Ross was the name of the engine. When a firefighter puts on their suit and adds an additional 40 pounds and they cannot bring their suit home, 
and 10 to 15 times a year a fire hydrant is touched. Now to become a firefighter, you must, the city will announce an opening and closing date. You must apply within those dates. Then after you apply, you must take a written exam to make sure you can do basic math and reading skills. Then you must take a physical agility test, which consists of running up seven flights of stairs, pulling yourself through a hole and lifting up certain items. Afterwards, you get hooked up to a lie detector. And if you are in the military, you get five extra points. The fire chief then picks the firemen to hire and everything is scored and you must have a 83% or higher to become a firefighter. Now to move up the ranks, however, you must take multiple tests. You can apply to be a specialist and you must take a multi-choice exam. You must also take hands-on slash written tests. And if you want to be a lieutenant, you'll be based on memory skills and grammar skills. Everything up is interviews for chief upgrading. Now, a little history about black firefighters. In 1955, Herbert Baines became the first black firefighter. He's studied to become a lieutenant, but in his list, he was held up, so he didn't make it. Baines sparked the consent decree, which meant for every white candidate, two blacks also had to be hired. The black firefighter, the second black firefighter, was Charles Fowler, and after him, they waited six years until blacks could be hired again. The consent decree was signed on May 7, 1974. 40% of black firefighters were reduced to 18%. In September 1968, the city hired three black far firemen, Barney Shepherd, Richard Charles, and Barney Blakey. The city would hire another three black firemen from 1867 to 1972. Tilford Youngblood and Ralph Nicholas filed a suit with the legal and security of Cincinnati. The suit stated that the CFD had discrimination in recruiting, testing, selecting, and hiring black applicants for the position of fire recruit. And with the result of the lawsuit, today it's 233 African American firemen that can move up in ranks, including 26 lieutenants and one chief. Hi. My name is Tilly Booth Heidinger, and for my eighth grade project, I chose to record an album. For my mentor, I chose my wonderful uncle, Mark Heidinger, who has been a professional musician for almost 25 years. My goal for this project was to record three professional sounding songs that meant something to me personally, and of course, to learn something along the way. As for the songs that I was going to sing, this was actually a really difficult decision. So my uncle and I sat down together and thought about which songs both complemented my voice and meant something to me personally, and we settled on these three songs, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, Hallelujah, and Spike. We had five recording sessions total, and each one looked very different depending on what we were going to do that day. Vocals, instrumentals, or editing, or all of the above. First, we would talk about what we were going to do for that day, and then get out and set up the equipment necessary for that, such as the different types of microphones we would get wired up, and set up the recording equipment on the computer. Next, we would record the instrumentals. Now, something I learned from this project is that it is a lot easier to record the instrumentals first and then the vocals. That makes it more simple to record the vocals because it's better to sing to instruments than to just a beat. Next, we recorded the vocals. Now, this was actually one of the most difficult parts of the project for me because hearing your own voice on a professional sounding recording is very strange at first, but after a while I got used to it and we managed to record all of the vocals. Once we had five or six tracks of both the instrumentals and the vocals, we were able to either choose whole ones that we thought sounded good on their own, or we could take bits and pieces of different tracks and put them together to make one really good one. Now, of course, the editing process is one of the most difficult parts of recording. It's, it's difficult to make everything seem seamless and like it only took one try, when in reality it might have taken two to fifteen. But with a lot of effort, we made it, and we finished the editing process. 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, I was unfortunately not able to finish all three of the songs that I initially wanted to do for this project. I was able to record and finish Somewhere Over the Rainbow and Spite, but I was not able to do Hallelujah due to this quarantine that we're in right now. I'd like to thank both of my parents for driving me back and forth between the recording studio and my house, which is about two hours, and of course, an extra special Thank you to my wonderful mentor and uncle, Mark Heidinger. Thank you, Uncle Mark. This project was a ton of fun to do, and I'm so glad to have had this opportunity. And now, without further ado, please enjoy my cover of Spite by Vandeveer. Thank you. Hello, my name is Aiden Bruner, and for my 8th grade project, I chose music production. Music production may seem simple at first, but it can mean many things. Normally, a music producer will either write music on their own or produce music for others. I chose music production because I love the idea of being able to freely create the music that I want. As with all things, music production requires skill, equipment, and a lot of money. The amount of equipment you need depends on the genre you choose and your budget. I went with electronic music because I need less external equipment, I didn't need vocals, and I like a lot of electronic based music. Music producers used to rely on analog equipment for production, but nowadays they use a digital audio workstation or DAW because it's a lot more affordable and a lot more capable than analog equipment. I saved up $300 to buy FL Studio, which is the DAW I use for music production. For my mentor, I found Joel Greenberg, a teacher at Cincinnati Music Academy. I wanted to find someone who could teach me about FL Studio as well as general information about producing music, so he was the perfect fit. I definitely couldn't have come this far without his help. In my first few lessons, I learned about music theory, and from there the lessons got more advanced. He was a great mentor, and I hope to keep working with him. When making a song digitally, the first step is to create the sound you want. For sound design, music producers use plugins. A plugin is a separate program that operates inside any digital audio workstation or production software. 
Basic plugins function as instruments or effects like reverb, EQ, and compression. Good plugins can be very expensive, so I went with the pre-installed ones that came with FL Studio. One of the plugins that I use most is called Flex. Flex is a plugin that allows you to choose a preset from a preset library and configure the sound the way you want. I use this because it's advanced, yet very simple and easy to use. Every song needs a beat, but since recording equipment for a real-life drum set is extremely expensive, I use multiple plugins and sample packs such as FCP and FL Drum Synth Live. After designing and tweaking the sound, I record a melody from my keyboard into the piano roll. Then, I arrange the patterns in the playlist. If I want to add sound effects to my song, I download sounds from online sound libraries and put them into FL Studio. Once I have my patterns arranged in the playlist, I go to the mixer and make adjustments to the patterns. Here's where it gets creative. There are so many possibilities here. I can't even count how many different effects and plugins there are. But, I start with the simple stuff, like EQing, equalizing, editing volume, adding reverb, distortion, etc. Something interesting my mentor taught me is that when editing a song, it's important to note that the song will sound different depending on the space that you're in. For example, if you're in a car while listening to a song, it will sound more muffled than it would if you were listening to it in your house. So, when editing a song, I try my best to account for that. And finally, after a lot of hard work, this song is now complete. Over the summer of 2019, my dad signed me up for a photography class. Each week, they would assign homework. After about three months, I forgot most of this information. That's when I met my mentor, Tom Ullman. He taught me everything I needed to know and refreshed my memory. The first thing he taught me was shutter speed. A fast shutter speed captures movement, as you can see in these Google pictures here. Here are some of my examples. The first one, I set the shutter speed out for like 30 seconds and ran around my pitch black basement with a little light. And the third one is we attached an LED light to my cat's collar and played with him and he ran around with his toy. That was pretty fun. The next thing I learned about was a fast shutter speed. A fast shutter speed captures movement in a way of freezing time, as you can see in these Google pictures here. Here are some of my examples. The first picture is we took a cup and filled it with water and then dropped a rock in it. And this is what we ended up with. The third picture was similar, but with a wet paintbrush. Here are some more pictures. All these pictures are from different locations in Maine. The next thing I learned about was aperture. As you can see in this picture here, Aperture lets light into your camera. Here is a picture. This is my cat, Carlisle. I wanted to add some of the pictures of my cats that I took into my project. 
So here are some of the pictures I took of Carlisle. This beautiful girl is Rose. I know in the fourth picture it looks like I'm choking her. I was just scratching her under her chin, and I don't know why it looks like that. But she has really pretty eyes, even though it's kind of hard to see. Here are some more pictures I took at Maine. The last two pictures are little rock towers me and my dad built. They were scattered all over the beaches, so me and my dad decided to build some. As I mentioned before, we had homework during the photography classes. Here are just a few of my homework assignments that I had to do. The first one I tried to write high with light with a long shutter speed, and it actually kind of ended up working. Here are some more homework assignments that I had to do over the summer. The first one is of my cat Rose with rose petals on her. Yeah, I don't know why I took the picture. These next pictures are pictures that I took from Maine. I wasn't going to add the second one in there because there's a lot of people in it, but I thought it was a cool boat, so yeah. And I'd like to take this time to thank my dad for signing me up for a photography class, and for my camera, and my mom for a lot of support, and my mentor, Tom Ullman, for teaching me everything I needed to know. I'd also like to thank my cats for being excellent models and supporting me through all this. I'd also like to thank my dad again for helping me with this project and figuring out the audio thing. Yeah, I was having some technical difficulties. Hello, my name is Russell Corby. For my 8th grade project, I chose Spelunking, also known as Caving. The reason I chose this project that is that in 5th grade, our Spelunking trip got cancelled, and I've wanted to go in a cave ever since. I guess I just felt like I didn't want to miss out on that experience. My mentor for this project was Mr. George Shavey. Mr. George Shavey is an air quality meteorologist with over 40 years of atmospheric computer simulation experience. He began caving while a sophomore at Thomas More College in Northern Kentucky with friends and an uncle. He has been caving 40 to 50 times in central Kentucky, primarily Rock Castle County, southeast Indiana, and smaller caves in Ohio. He led a Sierra Cave outing in 1959 just north of the New River near Blacksburg, Virginia. He even ventured into a cave, Grot and Africans, in South America, while there teaching a course in 2002. While enjoying spelunking very much, he also enjoys farming, reading books, and family time. For my project, I had four main goals. 1. Learn about the equipment needed for caving. 2. Learn the basics of spelunking. 3. Learn about caves themselves. And 4. Go on a spelunking trip. Start with equipment. For On my spelunking trip, I brought a helmet, three light sources, warm clothing and extra clothes, snacks, gloves, a towel, bag to carry it all, cell phone, most importantly, people to cave with. Helmet. Almost any helmet will do. I use a rock climbing helmet. It just has to be able to protect your head. It is crucial as there are low ceilings in caves and your head will bump a lot. Three light sources. It's extremely important that you carry at least three light sources at all times. You should have your primary light, a headlamp attached to your helmet, secondary light, a handheld flashlight, an emergency light, an ordinary candle. You should also carry matches and extra batteries. Warm clothes and extra clothes. For a caving trip, you want to dress warmly. You should start with warm underclothes like long underwear and long sleeve shirts. Then find a sweatshirt and a pair of sweatpants that you're not too fond of. They will get very muddy. Also pack similar clothes for extra clothes. You can leave these at the mouth of the cave or where you pack. Park. These you'll put on once you get out of the cave, as you'll very likely be wet and muddy. Snacks. As you may be in cave for a very long time, it is good to pack a lunch, as well as some snackable foods like trail mix. This will keep your energy levels up and make for an overall better trip. 
gloves. Gardening or work gloves will do. They are important because it is very rocky inside a case, so to keep your hands safe. Towel. Your towel can stay with your dry clothes for after. It will be useful to dry yourself off. A bag. You will want a backpack or a bag that you can carry on your back. This is where you carry your food, extra light, sources, and batteries. Cell phone. It is good to bring a cell phone so you can contact help if people get hurt, someone gets hurt, and to take pictures. And last but not least, people a cave with. This is the most important thing. You should never go in a cave with less than four people. The main reason is that if someone were to get seriously hurt, you could leave one person with the injured person while two others could go to get help. On November 16th, 2019, we arrived at Pine Hill Cave, which is right off the highway. The group consisted of me, my dad, Mr. Shavy, Mrs. Warren, Mr. Warren, Elliot, Mr. Thomas, Mrs. Warren, Mrs. Warren's brother Jeremy, and some of his friends. Prepared to enter the cave, sorting out helmets and snacks and stuff like that, as shown in these pictures here. Then we went in the cave for around four hours. Inside of the cave, it was rocky, wet, muddy, and pitch black. For a good portion of our trip, we were walking in an underground river. We had lunch, enjoyed the darkness, and explored many tunnels in the cave. We saw many white spiders, like this one. You could often look up and see around hundreds of them, a few inches above your head. Finally, Some more pictures from inside the cave and there's me with a rock formation and some of the rock formation we saw were soda straws little tubular formations to hang out down like this we saw some bigger ones actually some longer ones than these and then st stalagmites stalactites and columns so what, well, we saw all three of these i believe but they weren't really as big as these And finally, when everyone was tired and wet, we exited the cave, dried off, changed into dry clothes, and enjoyed some aliases. That concludes my presentation. I want to give a huge thanks to Mr. Shavey and Mrs. Warren, who made this whole thing possible. My mom and dad, for giving me love and care the whole way through. Thank you for listening, and remember, think much. Hello everyone, I'm Evan Cornwall from my 8th grade project, I Chose Cake Decorating. I was originally inspired by the amazing cakes that people are able to make on the baking shows that all my brothers love to watch. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could do that? The first skill for me to learn was icing a cake. My mom informed me that a family friend's birthday was coming up. I knew that it would be a great opportunity to practice cake decorating for the first time. Here's how our cake turned out. Nailed it! I knew I needed a mentor. Fortunately, I received an incredible offer from a Waldorf dad, Mike Merrick, to be taught by a very talented cake decorator, Rebecca Vibbert, at Empire Bakery, the bakery that does all the cake decorating for the Kroger store. On my first day at Empire Bakery, I learned how to ice a cake well, airbrush decorative designs, and pipe a nice border onto a cake. I made this cake for my family, as well as one for my mom's friend. For that cake, I learned how to make designs, like avocados, by printing on edible paper. As time went by, I got better and better. I learned many new skills, such as adding a melted chocolate drip onto a cake, making iced flowers and rosettes, and adding sprinkles to the sides of cakes. Some of these techniques are evident on this cake that I decorated. My project seemed to be going very well. Then disaster struck. When I first realized that I would no longer be meeting with my mentor due to social distancing, I knew my progress would greatly slow down, but I never gave up. After a while of getting used to the distance learning, it was time for my next cake. Only then I was teaching myself, with much help from YouTube and my parents. My mind was set on a geocake, 
An example is shown here with the illusion that it has, it has a geode on the inside. But you'll notice in this example that the cake is smooth on the outside, and that's because it is covered with fondant rather than icing like the last cakes I showed you. Fondant is a useful and edible Play-Doh-like substance that has been used to cover and decorate cakes for years. This is me making fondant from scratch, which is not an easy task. Then, by mixing and food coloring, I created a marble pattern before placing it onto a cake that I had baked. Next, I cut away a piece of the fondant and hollowed out space in my cake that I then lined with whipped topping. Next, I filled the space with rock candy to create the geode effect, and then added edible gold decorating paint to make my cake look extra nice. Personally, I am proud of my first geode cake, and I hope to get better at cake decorating as time moves on. My special thanks to Mike Merrick for his generosity, Rebecca Vibbert for being willing to pass her amazing decorating skills on to me, my brothers for supporting me and cheering me on, my parents who gave their undying support, attention, and care to me throughout this project, and of course Mrs. Warren for a great 8th grade year. I truly could not have done this project without all of them. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is Jackson, and for my 8th grade project, I learned to juggle. I'll admit it, at first I was struggling. But with time, I learned to juggle balloons, ropes, balls, and even books. The books kept falling on my head, though. I only had my shelf to blame. So now, my full juggling routine. So as I said, at first I was struggling. So I used balloons. Now I will show you juggling with balloons. Come here. Now, juggling with balloons. You! Knock my hat off. And you ruined my juggling? Again? This is the seventh time. Okay. You are done. Ugh. What? I thought he was done. Um, huh. Okay. That's weird. Okay. Now, juggling with three equal sized ropes. What happened? Okay. Here. Aha. Uh -huh. Just look up here, not down there. See? Ta-da! All equal. Now? Uh, uh, uh. Ah. Um. Ta-da! All equal. Just not down there. Yeah. Okay, um, here, just maybe if I pull on them really hard. Huh? They're equal. One, two, three. Now, I will juggle with my mind. Okay. So this is my magical jokers tube, which I will put over here. As you can see, they have a certain order. So first you put in green, then yellow, then red. Now, The red has gone to the bottom, the yellow to the top, and the green to the middle. Now again. Oh. First green, then the yellow, then 
or red. Now, red move to the bottom, yellow move to the top, and the green move to the middle. Now, I'm going to show it to you only one more time, but this time will be different. So, oh, first the green, then the yellow, but this time the red goes in the magical Joker's box. Thank you. As I said, I'm Jackson, and I'd like to thank three, uh, my dad, my mom, for their constant support, my family for being such a great audience, and my mentor for teaching me everything I know about magic. And I'd also like to thank the Cincinnati Waldorf School. Thank you. Hello, my name is CJ Danimer, and for my 8th grade project, I did Madu Do and Wing Chun self-defense. Madu Do and Wing Chun are very similar to karate and kung fu, seeing as they are both martial arts, but they do have very different techniques in their fighting styles. This is the very annoying and uncomfortable gi I had to wear while attending classes. I will now tell you more about Madu Do and Wing Chun in my slideshow. This is where I took classes at Martial Arts of America, two to three times a week. There are nine skills in Madu Do. These skills are designed to establish self-discipline, socialization skills, physical activity, self-confidence, respect, and nonviolent conflict resolution. The first skill is called Stand Up. This skill teaches you how to use your hands, feet, elbows and knees in a variety of situations. The second skill is called grappling. This skill displays different methods of defense used when being grabbed by an attacker. Knife defense is the third skill, which shows how to defend against various knife attacks. The fourth skill is called legal weapons. This skill teaches you to use common items such as rods, pins, and pencils as effective weapons for defending yourself. And this skill you will also learn to how to use the bow as a weapon, which is a long pole that comes to a point at both ends. The fifth skill, sweeping, shows how to knock an opponent to the ground with leg sweeps. The sixth skill, pressure points, shows how to use pressure points on a defender's body to leave them weak and vulnerable. In the seventh skill, throwing, you learn which shoulder and hip throws are effective against certain types of attacks. The eighth skill is called ground fighting which is fighting on the ground. The ninth skill is called Qigong, which is an ancient Chinese art of breath control and relaxation.
I'd like to thank my mentors, Mike Franzen and Master Wong, and my parents for driving me to class twice a week. Hi, my name is Alex DeFore, and for my eighth grade project, I decided to do drums. My mentor was Hazen Frick, and he taught me how to learn how to play the drum kit. Um, I was taking lessons with him until COVID-19 caused me to be unable to take lessons, so now I'll show you the drum kit. So. This is the hi-hat, this is a splash cymbal, this is a crash cymbal, this is a crash ride cymbal, so it's like this and this combined, and this is the ride cymbal. These are the two toms, this is the lower and higher tom, this is the floor tom, this is the kick drum, and then this is the snare. Um, I'd like to play a solo, I hope you enjoy. I am Olivia, and for my 8th grade project, I did makeup and tribal belly dancing. For most of the year, I worked on makeup, but I had to switch over to belly dancing for the last three months. At first, I shadowed my mentor at her studio and helped her with cleaning brushes while taking notes. She showed me how important sanitation is. Then we moved on to learning about the color wheel. Sanitation. Sanitation is very important. Always wash your hands, use disposable applicators, don't use makeup directly from the product, keep track of expiration dates on products, and avoid unsanitary practices. The color wheel. Knowing the color wheel is essential for a makeup artist. You have to understand warm and cool undertones and what colors complement each other. Color correcting is also very important for a makeup artist to know. Green cancels red, purple cancels yellow, pink cancels brown, orange cancels blue, peach cancels blue, and yellow cancels redness. I'm going to show you some of the many kinds of makeup my mentor has done. She has done many beautiful artistic photo shoots such as this one and this one. She has also done many weddings and many other beautiful things. Some of them are for Halloween. There are millions of things people can do with makeup, such as Halloween, special occasions, photo shoots, special effects, movies, etc. Now I'm going to show you one of the models I helped with. This was the model. She was really nice. When my mentor laid down a white foundation on her face, the hairstylist began doing her, her hair. She used airbrush makeup on top. After she got done with the face, she began putting clay around her chest and back and made it appear as if it was cracking. This was the set for the photo shoot. This is them color correcting. Then the hairstylist put more white roses in her hair. Before final touch-ups, they had to make sure the color was color corrected as well. Final touch-ups. The shoot took all day, but in the end, it was worth it. She was beautiful. She was also very tall. <laughs> and now for my second project, tribal belly dancing. My mentor and I worked together after lunch some days during school, but due to the quarantine, we had to use Zoom or FaceTime. We made it work. I'm very grateful for my belly dancing mentor. She was very patient with me and showed me how to do everything.
I would like to thank my mentors, Ashley, Olivia, and Miss Warren. To the left is Ashley, and to the right is Miss Warren. Thanks for watching. Hello, my name is Hans Gonzalez, and for my 8th grade project, I chose mountain biking. So there are four main steps to getting started with mountain biking. The first step is finding and buying a good mountain bike, then maintaining and fixing it, and of course riding it. Since I didn't have a lot of money to spend on an expensive mountain bike, I was choosing between the Specialized, Cannondale, and Kona, since these brands are pretty cheap and good quality. I ended up choosing a Specialized Rockhopper Hardtail, which means it's front suspension only. And this is my bike. As far as maintaining and fixing my bike goes, I clean it regularly, and if I notice any issues going on, I go to a local bike shop to check it out. I highly recommend spun bicycles in Northside. A big part of my project was spent working on several bike trails in Mount Airy Forest with Cora, which is a volunteer trail building mountain bike crew. You can actually check these trails out. It's on West Fork Road off of 74, right near Putz's Ice Cream. These are some of the most common tools that I use while building trails at Mount Airy Forest. The first one furthest to the right is a rogue hoe. This tool is used for bench cutting, which is where you cut into the side of a hill to make a rideable level ground, and also for flattening and pounding the ground. The next tool is a wheelbarrow, which is really helpful in transporting dirt and rocks away from the work site. The last tool is a serrated saw, which we would use to saw down honeysuckle and other invasive plants. And these are some pictures I took of the trail and me bench cutting. These three trails are probably my favorite trails in Cincinnati and Kentucky. The first one is DeVoe Park in Covington. It's probably my favorite of these three parks. DeVoe has steep and technical climbs and fast descents. Definitely my favorite place to ride. The second one is England Idlewild in Burlington, Kentucky. This park has flat flow trails and a small jump track that's good for beginners. The last park is Lebanon Bike Park. This park's mainly for BMX riders, but also good for mountain bikers. It's got a huge jump track and two really fun pump tracks. If you have a mountain bike, I really recommend you check out these parks. Special thanks to my mom for driving me everywhere and buying my mountain bike. My mentor Troy for teaching me to build mountain bike trails and the basics of mountain biking. Rob and Rebecca for giving me an action camera and all the accessories. And Cora or Cincinnati Off-Road Alliance for letting me work with them and teaching me how to mountain bike. And here is a video of my mountain biking progress.
Hello, my name is Joel, and for my 8th grade project, I chose to learn how to game program. Our first question is, what is game programming? Well, in the most basic description, it is building a game on a computer using code. In most cases, a new game programmer, like myself, will use a game engine. Of course, game programming isn't only typing code into a computer. Another important aspect is working with 3D art. What is a game engine then? A game engine is usually built by professional coders to make games easier to make for less experienced coders like myself. Some game engines are designed for professional coders, while others are made for new beginners. I chose one called Unity because it had a pretty easy feel to it, and also there were so many people willing to help me out. So now we know what a game engine is, but what is code? Code is a language created so it is more simple to tell a computer what to do. Code is constantly being improved on every day, but it was first created almost 180 years ago by a woman named Ada Lovelace. Now we move on to art, which was one of my favorite parts of my project. I had a lot of fun creating levels for my games and making art. So this is a picture of my original game. It looks very basic though, and my goal is to make it look good. So after about 40 minutes of work, I made this, which um, I really like this look a lot better because it looks just a step closer to real. So now we move on to this time lapse of me making my final game. I decided to have it like a racetrack set in space because I thought that might look good. So my first step was to make the lighting a little bit lower so it would look like I'm in space. Another important step was to download a skybox with stars on it so it would look like it was a nighttime sky. Then my next step was to light the place and I couldn't figure out anything that looked better than this, so I chose to have spotlights running around the track. So I thought that looked the best out of any of my choices. The only drawback was it took about 15 minutes to do. One small issue with Unity Engine, the engine I'm using to make this, is that sometimes the system tries to make the lights rotate on their own and I did not want that, I just wanted them to be stationary. So I had to animate them so they would stay still. So as you can tell, I'm not good at animating because it took me a solid maybe three minutes, but I finally figured it out and worked it out to be on all the lights. So here's some gameplay from my game. Finally, I'd like to thank everyone who helped me with this project. Um, I'd like to thank my mom for sitting through and watching me do tons of boring stuff on the computer. I'd like to thank my dad for giving me lots of great ideas along the way. And I'd like to thank my mentor, Kevin Corby, for helping with programming and coding and teaching me basic skills. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone on the Unity Forum who helped me along the way, making this project a lot easier with their help was very appreciated. I'm Riley, and for my eighth grade project, I did Canvas Painting. First, I would like to thank my family for all their support and my mentor for all her instructions and guidance. So in early December, my mentor, Allison, who is a high school art teacher, invited me to attend her art club where I learned the basics of acrylic painting. I also joined an art class at the art workshop. When it became time for me to decide on a subject to paint for my presentation, I decided I wanted to paint pictures of nature that I had taken while on vacation. 
The two photos I chose to paint were both taken in California on a beach. I filmed myself painting in fast motion so that you could see the whole process. Hi, I'm Allie, and for my 8th grade project, I decided to study contemporary dancing. I started my project in late September of 2019 with my mentor, Brittany Collier. At my first meeting with my mentor, I learned some of the basic contemporary dance moves such as leaps and turns. It was definitely a very challenging experience for me at first because I had never performed any of these dance moves before. 
At the beginning of each dance lesson, I would warm up, stretch, and then do my right and left splits as well as my straddle. Slowly but surely, I continued to improve my turns, leaps, splits, and straddle, and I even learned some new skills along the way, such as a back bend, tilt, and more. A few times a month, Brittany had me do some core arm and leg exercises to help strengthen my body parts and thereby help improve my dance moves. In late November, Brittany taught me my first combo, which is basically just a small bit of choreography. Brittany had me come up with some choreography that would later be incorporated into my final dance. Then in mid-January, Brittany taught me the first part of choreography to the song that I had chosen months before for my final dance. From then on, at each dance lesson, Brittany taught me a new part of the choreography. Each time I did the choreography, Brittany would give me feedback on what I did well and what I needed a little work on. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to learn the rest of the choreography because I was not able to continue meeting with my mentor due to everything that's going on right now. Thankfully, I was able to end at a good stopping point to the dance the last time I met with my mentor, so that is what I will be presenting now. Loving can hurt Loving can hurt sometimes But it's the only thing that I know When it gets hard You know it can get hard sometimes It is the only thing Makes us feel alive We keep this love in a photograph We make these memories for ourselves Where our eyes are never closing our Hearts are never broken and Time's forever frozen still So you can keep me Inside the pocket of your ripped Jeans holding me closer till our eyes meet. You won't ever be alone. Wait for me to come home. Loving can heal. I want to give a huge thank you to Brittany Collier for spending hours patiently teaching me new skills and choreography. And I also want to thank my family for the endless support, especially my mom for driving me to and from dance lessons and taking pictures and videos. Thank you. Hello, my name is Emmett Leahy, and for my eighth grade project, I chose to make a cabinet. The reason why I chose this project is because I've always enjoyed woodworking class, but I wanted to take it a step further. The first thing I had to do was find a mentor, and luckily, one of my parents' friends Mr. Steve Fields is a carpenter. After I contacted him asking if he would be my mentor, he replied saying that he would be glad to. The design I chose is this, to have bookshelves on the top, a foldable desk in the middle, and drawers on the bottom. After we picked out the wood that we were going to use, which is sassafras, we edited the dimensions and made a materials list. After we picked up the materials, we brought them to his shop and began working. The first thing that we did was ripping. Ripping is when you cut the wood along its grain to the right width and so it has a fresh cut. Then we glued it using these pipe clamps for holding it together. Then we planed it. Planing is when you run it through this machine to get it to the right thickness that you want it to be. And this is a video of the planing. Okay. 
Then we needed to cut it. After we measured the the length of the side and shelf panels, we cut it. And this is a video of me using this saw to cut. Go ahead. Then we use the table saw to make the dado cuts. The dado cuts are these little grooves that the shelf panels sit in. Then we drilled the hole holes for the adjustable shelves. Then we used a jigsaw to cut the feet on both of the side panels. Then we put a clue coat on all of the panels. We put two coats on the tops of the shelf panels and one on the bottom and then three coats on the side panels. Then I used a router to make a groove in the back of the side panels for the plywood to sit in evenly through the back. Then we gathered the materials that we would need and cut them to the right length and width for the face frame. Then we used a pocket hole drill and pocket hole screws to drill together the face frame. Then we used the jigsaw to cut the feet on the front of the face frame. For attaching the face frame, we needed to glue it on. So I put glue on the top surface of the cabinet. And then Mr. Fields nailed it down using the nail gun. For filling in the holes that the nails left, we got some glue and put it on the holes. Then we sanded it. This lets the sawdust get in the glue and fill in the holes to make it look nice. Then we, I finished sanding the rest of the face screen. And then I sanded the sides. And this took by far the most time of any of the steps because sanding is a long process if you want your work to be nice and smooth and look good. And this is a video of me sanding. Due to scheduling difficulties, I was not able to finish my project, but that will not stop me from finishing it later on. The next steps that I will take will be building and adding in the drawers to the bottom, cutting and adding the fold folding desk piece to the middle, and then cutting the plywood and putting it on the back for the finish. I would like to thank my mentor, Mr. Steve Fields, for letting me use his shop and helping me through this project. I would also like to thank my dad for helping out and being a third pair of hands. Also my family for their support, helping me get there and back, and for helping me make this slideshow. Thank you. Hello, my name is Oliver Udomsuk, and for my 8th grade project, I made a short film. My project started in late summer of 2019 when I attended a two-week-long intensive film class where I produced a film with a team of four other people. In November, the film that I produced with my team was selected to be screened at the NKU Oink Film Festival. We're just gonna use that. No, do it again and say- Shortly wait. afterwards, I began writing my own script and planning for producing my own film. In December, I cast the film and started scouting for locations. And in February, I started shooting some scenes. Things were going great until about mid-March, when I experienced a major setback. The shelter-in-place ordinance pretty much put a stop to my production. Because of this, I had to adapt what I had already shot to make my film a cohesive piece. And here is the product as it stands now. No artistic piece is ever like its original vision, and is always a reflection of the time you are in. I just want to give a huge thank you to my mentors Pippin Rush, Hannah Schultz, and Frank O'Farrell. And I also want to give a huge thank you to both my parents for taking me places and putting up with me. Okay.
12 years ago, there was a deadly virus that took out half of the world's population. All of the wealthy and, as society would see it, important people left Earth for Alpha Centauri to start a new life on a new world and escape the virus, leaving the rest of the people behind to fend for themselves. Gang leaders emerged and took over, monopolizing supplies and territories. Us Earthlings left to rot, we claimed our turf and defended it tooth and nail. I'm Nova, one of the lucky ones left behind. There's only one thing on my mind, that's to find my mother. She was taken by one of the world's leaders to use her knowledge to find a cure to keep for themselves. I heard a rumor that one of the most powerful gang leaders had a ship, a ship that I could take to find my mother. I got the one person I could trust, Spencer, to help me steal it. What are you doing here? Do you have a death wish? You'll tell me or else. We will never tell you. Oh, you will tell me. <laughs> will you tell me now? Never. We can't die like this. It's not worth it. Your friend is right. And if this is your wish, so be it. Wait a second! Where'd you get this necklace? I used to work with a lady that had one just like this. Ursula. How do you know my mother? That's your mother? Yes. I just want to be with her. I understand. Maybe we can work something out for each other here. You see, I used to be Ursula's assistant, and right before she was taken off on that ship, she almost had a cure for the virus. If you can get me that research, I'll get you in your ship. Do we have a deal? Deal. I'm going to find my mother and bring her back to save Earth, our home. I just want to give a huge thank you to my mentors Pippin Rush, Hannah Schultz, and Frank O'Farrell. And I also want to give a huge thank you to both my parents for taking me places and putting up with me. Okay. <laughs> hey, what's your name and what brings you here today? Hello, my name is Tom Royce. I am here to present my 8th grade project, which is titled Studying Space Phenomena. After studying black holes, supernovas, and dark matter, I chose to present the letter to you. Then tell us how did you gain your knowledge about space phenomena? 
Sparked by stargazing during camping trips and the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, over the past year I got more and more interested. I started reading books, I went to lectures at the Cincinnati Observatory and met with Dean Regis who became a mentor for this project. Dean is the Cincinnati Observatory astronomer and has been featured in the New York Times and you can hear him talk on local radio shows. So tell us, why did you choose dark matter over the other phenomena? Ever since I heard and learned about this mysterious term about a year ago, I've been completely fascinated by it. You got my interest. What is dark matter then? Simply put, when you use the models that are trying to explain the universe, there are many observations that need 85% more mass than we can see to comply with our models. This missing mass, or matter, cannot be seen. It is dark, therefore dark matter. To understand further, we should start at the beginning of the universe and the role of gravity. Okay, let's do that. So, what was at the beginning? The most common theory about the beginning is the Big Bang. The Big Bang was when everything was compact very, very small and exploded outward. After the explosion, particles started to form elements due to gravity pulling them together. Elements eventually forming everything around us and ourselves. This is what we call the universe. The boundaries to space and everything within those boundaries. Could you explain gravity again? Yeah, sure. Gravity is masses pulling on one another. Gravity was first discovered in 1687 by Sir Isaac Newton, who watched an apple fall into the ground while thinking about the force of nature. Newton concluded, the greater the mass, the greater the gravitational pull, such as Earth's gravity pulling on the apple. Gravity is continuously pulling on universal masses. What did you say in the beginning about missing mass? Over time, many observations have been made as to why more mass is necessary to the universe to work as we observe it. I will give you two examples. The first example is called gravitational lensing. We know that the path of light is influenced by an optical lens. Einstein's theory predicted that the path of light is also influenced by gravity, which has since been proven true. But we have observed that the mass of an object alone is not enough to bend light as much as it does. It will need about 85% more mass to do so. The second example is called gravitational pull. Gravity is needed to hold any large-scale universal structure and allow galaxies to spin. But again, the observable mass is 85% less than needed to explain the constellations of structures and the rate that galaxies spin at. We see clusters that should not exist. We see galaxies that spin much too fast. Okay, okay. So do we know what the 85% are then? A theory has been developed about what the 85% of missing mass is. The theory is that there is mass that is not observable or detectable by today's means. This mass is believed to be an undiscovered particle within the elements which only react through gravity. Uh, so what are the elements made of then? The elements are what everything in the universe is made of. Each element is made up of different particles and the atom. The ones you may have heard of, protons, the neutrons, and the electrons. They're the ones that are less known, but have also been discovered over the decades. The leptons, the quarks, and the bosons. Ah, that's interesting. Can you put it in a nutshell for us? I'll try. Dark matter is known to exist because of the influence of gravity it has on directly observable objects. Dark matter is theorized to be made of of particles that do not reflect, emit, absorb any light, meaning they are undetectable. Whatever it is, to me dark matter is very fascinating and I believe that a great discovery will be made very soon. Thank you for watching. At this time I would like to thank my mentor Dean Regis for his contribution and my parents for everything. I would also like to thank Aaron Jodok for being my mentor for my previous project.
for my 8th grade project, I chose to learn aerial silks. Aerial silks is an airborne form of gymnastics with two panels of silks that you can climb up, drop from, or do poses from. It was very fun but extremely challenging to learn. Before my presentation, I would like to thank my mentor, Yvonne Swally, for teaching me everything I know, and for Paul Miller for letting me use his rig for choreographing, and for my family for driving me everywhere and supporting me and putting up with me. I'm Laszlo Thomas, and for my 8th grade project, I built a treehouse.
I decided to build a tree house because I always enjoyed the idea of having almost like a second home somewhere near to my house that I could go out and visit or hang out with my friends or even spend the night. And so I always enjoyed the idea of having something like that. The next step was finding a mentor for the project. And my, my neighbor, Django Croner, who happens to be a professional treehouse builder, agreed to be my mentor. The next thing to do was find a suitable tree to build my treehouse in. And after looking around our property for a while, we finally found this red oak tree right here. And we were pretty sure this was gonna be the one we were gonna use right away because it was so big and tall and it was, and a red oak is also one of the strongest wood to build a tree house in. So once my mentor saw this and I saw this, we both agreed that this was gonna be the one we were gonna use. So at the tree house site, there's a very steep hill that we had to build on. So right away we knew that we had to build a platform so that we would have a flat surface to work off of. And after we had that flat surface to work off of, we had to get all of our materials down to the site. And this was definitely not easy. We would have to take everything that we used for the tree house, either up the hill from our house to the tree house, or we would drive up to my neighbor's house and come down the hill with all the different materials. And so that took us a while. had all of the lumber and hardware that we needed we got a bunch of scaffolding from Midwest Grip and Lighting which is a company that my dad sometimes works for and so they were generous and lent us some of their scaffolding and we knew we wanted some scaffolding so that we were would be able to get high enough up in the tree to build a pretty serious tree house. So normally building a platform like this on the ground would be pretty easy, but being about 20 to 28 feet up in the air, it was definitely not easy. And for the most part, it was just me and my dad doing all the different construction. And the first thing we had to do was put in two tabs, which are tree attachment bolts on both sides of the tree. And this took us a while for each of them because we had to drill a hole that was six inches deep and then we had to use a wrench and actually a pipe attached to it to get enough leverage to screw that bolt into the tree and after we had one in both sides we were able to put up our first beams after we had our first beams up we then started on the framing process and the framing process took us a while after we had the framing done we then had to use our knee braces to help support the treehouse. And for the knee braces, we had to put other tabs, treehouse attachment bolts, into the tree lower down and put our other beams at a 45 degree angle. So here's the tree and then our two tabs stick out like this and our two main sister beams run parallel to each other like this and on top of that, we have all of our, our framing joists running perpendicular to them. And on top of that, we have our decking boards that will go parallel to our main sistered beams. So with the construction of this main platform, it's definitely overbuilt. And so it can support a lot of weight. And we did this so that one day I can eventually add walls and a roof and make it an actual house and that's something I'm looking forward to coming up here with my friends or even my family and just enjoying being up this high and all the different scenery. I'd like to thank my mentor Django Croner, my mom and my dad, my grandparents, my neighbors Tom and Mary Kay, Ezra and Luke Shelley, 
my sister Stella and her boyfriend Jack, our friend Mark DeYoung, and Midwest Grip and Lighting. Hopefully once this is all built, I can escape my family and go out into my treehouse and stay out here for as long as I want. Hi, I'm Mary Erbis, and for my three project, I chose to write and illustrate a picture book. I wasn't sure where to begin, but my mentor, Mary Kay, is a children's book author and offered me advice on how to start. My first step was to go to the library. I checked out about 20 kids' books. I read through them looking for ideas for a plot and styles of illustration that I liked. I decided to use pastels for my art and came up with the plot with help from my family and mentor. Next, I went to the art store to buy paper and pastels. After I had all of my supplies, I created a storyboard which helps organize what text goes on what page. I chose to write the text before drawing the pictures. Then I made a storyboard to organize the drawings. And I created a timeline to help stay on track. Finally, I was ready to start my illustrations. It took much longer than I thought and it was difficult to keep up with all the work. I made a total of 16 drawings. Then I uploaded them to the computer and decided to use Blurb as my publisher. Next, I formatted the book and added text. After emailing it to my mentor for edits, I was finally ready to send it to the publisher. I would like to thank my parents for their endless support, especially my dad for helping with technical challenges, and my mentor for her helpful insight and ongoing encouragement. Have you seen my wagon? Daisy awoke bright and early, ready to do some gardening, but when she went to her shed, her wagon was nowhere to be found. Daisy went to Bear's house. Have you seen my wagon? asked Daisy. Bear had not. Take these rocks, said Bear. They may be useful. Daisy went on her way. Next, she arrived at Fox's house. Have you seen my wagon? asked Daisy. Fox had not. Take this tree bark, said Fox. It may be useful. Daisy took the bark and went on her way. Next, she went to Squirrel's house. Have you seen my wagon? asked Daisy, but Squirrel had not. Take this branch, said Squirrel, it may be useful. Finally, Daisy headed to Bird's house. Have you seen my wagon? asked Daisy. No, but I have an idea, said Bird. What is it? asked Daisy. You will find out soon, answered Bird. Daisy left the rocks, the branch, and the tree bark with Bird. And went home. That night, Daisy fell asleep, disappointed that she did not find her wagon. While she was asleep, bear, fox, squirrel, and bird were hard at work. The next morning, Daisy awoke to a knock at the door. What a surprise, her friends had built a new wagon just for her. Hi, and welcome to the question and answer portion of the eighth grade projects. Each student will be asked a question or two that were given to us from the faculty of the Cincinnati Waldorf School. First up, we have Russell. Hi, Russell. Hello. If you were in the cave for four hours, how did you use the bathroom? Well, there's no real bathroom in a cave. If you need to go number one, you can do that any, basically anywhere in the cave, that's all right. If you have to go number two, that's a bit more, it's a bit inconvenient. You can't really do that in a cave. You try not to do that. If you really have to, I guess you can. But if you, if you can, you want to get out of the cave and find a real bathroom. Thank you, Russell. Hi, Evan. Hi. Um, do you, oh, what? Do the cakes, especially the fondant and decorating frosting, taste as good as they look? Most of my cakes were made in about two hours and they spend almost no time in the freezer or refrigerator. So those didn't stale, so they tasted pretty good. My fondant cake, I made the fondant from scratch, so it tasted a lot better than fondant you would buy. But that cake had to spend a lot of time in the refrigerator, so it staled, and the result didn't taste as good. 
Thank you, Evan. Jackson. Yes. Do you actually know how to juggle? I had no intention at all to learn to juggle. It was magic from the very beginning. And I just used juggling as my routine and uh, as a theme to go with. Because uh, for all magicians, you have a routine, several routines to make a show. So with every trick, each trick was a routine that I had to practice. And I themed it all as juggling because it's also about building up your character that you're going to play and act. Uh, so I did not actually learn to juggle at all. Thank you, Jackson. Alex. Yes, Miss Warren. What particular styles of drumming and music are of the most interest to you? Um, right now, I've put in a lot of interest into jazz and alternative rock, but I have drifted into some genres called lo-fi, which are fun to play on drums, and um, jazz is really unique, and so is funk with drums, but um, what I really started with was more rock and punk and metal. But with drums, you can really shift around and do almost every genre since it's really open. Thank you, Alex. Hi, Joel. Hello. Mm -hmm. Unity looks complex for the beginning game, game programming. Was there enough information in the online documentation and the online forums for you to use? So how I started out this eighth grade project was I was going to do stand-up comedy. So that shows I don't really have that much of a brain. But um, I pretty much learned everything just by looking at Unity. I didn't really go on the forums till later in the project because like, I didn't know they existed. So if you were a beginner, um, I definitely suggest going to the websites because it's kind of a pain to find out everything by yourself. But yeah, they were very helpful. Thank you, Joel. Lulani. Hello. You're going to have to be louder, Lulani. Okay. Which of the international dishes that you made was your very favorite? And if um, you choose a favorite, which one would you definitely make again? I don't have a favorite, but I would definitely make the banitza again because that was really good, and then the butter tarts because those were very good. Yeah. Would you like to visit the countries of origins of your recipes? If I had the chance, definitely. There was quite a bit of spicy food. What was your favorite international cuisine before your project, and what is it now? Before my project, I don't know what my favorite would be, but now I'd say probably the um, Bonitza, probably, because that was very good. Great, thank you. Tilly. Yes, Miss Warren? Who played guitar for your recording of Spite? Um, my uncle and mentor, Mark Heidinger, did all of the guitar recordings for my songs. He also did recor guitar recordings for Somewhere Over the Rainbow, and he's been playing guitar pretty much professionally since he was in high school, so. Awesome. Just as a side note, you, the person that wrote this question said that you have the voice of an angel. Oh, thank you. Piper. Hi. Speak a little louder. Hi. There we go. What technique or photographic effect in photography were you most eager to learn and why? Well, probably like how to keep my pictures from being overexposed or underexposed because like I wanted to take pictures of my cats and that's like kind of what I needed to do that because they like, yeah. 
And the second question, was it easier to capture a still mm -hmm. shot outside or a moving shot? Probably a moving shot because I had more help for that because my uncle helped me a little bit with the first one, but then I got to do it on my own after like he helped me with it. So probably that one. Thank you, Piper. Izzy. Yes, this one. You have to speak louder. Sorry. Better? There you go. I love the choreography that you did. What tricks look hard, but you thought were easy? Um, a single footlock is usually a very showy move that a lot of people use in choreographed dances and performances. It looks very hard, but it's actually one of the first moves I ever learned. And that's always really fun to slip into a performance. What move looks easy, but is actually really hard? Probably the single footlock. Also one that I used in the very beginning, I was a bit afraid of it at first because you have to just let go of your hands and your feet and just trust the silks that you're not gonna fall and die. So that was a bit more challenging to learn. Okay, what were your biggest physical challenges learning silks compared to other sports? You have to have strength in your whole body, not just a few key muscles. I didn't know my hand strength was lacking until I first tried to climb and I couldn't do it until about like a month in because I couldn't grip the silks to stay and rewrap my feet because my hand strength wasn't enough. What were your mental challenges? Uh, getting over the fear of falling, just completely letting go, falling backwards, forwards, or sideways. And yeah, I had to trust my mentor, my silks, and myself a lot. And that was pretty terrifying to get over. Excellent, thank you, Izzy. Laszlo. Yeah. What a lot of hard work. About how many hours did you work on the treehouse? So, it's a pretty good question. I had to do a little bit of math. Basically, I worked like physical labor about on and off for about three weeks with about maybe eight to 10 hours a day. So it comes out to about like 170 hours. That's a lot. Yeah. Did you have fun? Yeah, it was, it was definitely really rewarding. Sometimes when something would be challenging, it would be like, tough to figure out how to do it, but it was definitely rewarding when I would figure out how to do something like that. Thank you, Laszlo. Mary. Hi, Ms. Mom. Hi. Of all the amazing illustrations that you did for the book, which one was your favorite? Um, so my favorite one, it was like page nine, and it's like a blue sky with like you can see part of like a tree and then like a bird and then like the bunny is sitting on the tree and I like that one because I think it just like I didn't really like mess up on this one because all the other ones I like messed up and so this one just like looks pretty good. Do you have it there with you? I do. Here, can you show it to us? Oh that one's my favorite too. Oh good. Yay. <laughs> Thank you Mary. Aiden. Yes. What part do you find most satisfying? The writing, uh, arranging, or mixing of the music? Um, let's see. That's kind of hard to answer. Probably, I like the writing and the sound design a lot because, like, uh, yeah, I, I think the writing, if I had to answer that, but I think everything was good. The better way to answer that, I think, would be like my least favorite part was probably mixing because it was so hard to get it right, like just the way you wanted it. Like you had to go back and forth with everything. And uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't know. So probably the writing and sound design. Okay. 
I have some more questions for you. Did you go into this project with a song idea or did experimenting with the process give you ideas? And how many songs did you create? Um, well, the, I went into the project. I don't know. I, I wouldn't say I had an idea for like a song, like an actual song, but I definitely had the idea that I wanted to like be able to create music. And uh, I, let's see, I, um, I have like two main projects that I'm working on and I sort of just like uh, mess around other times. So like I'll create like random songs and stuff like that that never really get finished because it's just fun, but yeah. Thank you, Aiden. Ollie? This was one. How do you feel about the relationship between your video and current events? Well, I started the concept for the project in late October. And so it was a, like a big coincidence. So it, I feel it made my project like more relevant to the time, I guess. Okay. And second question, how did you make the spaceship fly? Okay, so I downloaded a a 3D model that someone already created. And I took that into a software called After Effects and layered that over some footage that I took of the city and the sky. And then I um, took uh, propane torches and recorded those and added those to the back to make it look like it uh, has a propellant. And then I took all that and I animated it and scaled it. Wow, thank you. Uh, Riley. Yes, Ms. Warren? How long did it take you to paint the paintings in real time? I painted for a total of six days and each day was an average of about three to four hours. And can you describe the technology you used to record yourself? I used my mom's old iPhone and I put it on a really tall tripod right above my head. Besides being aesthetically pleasing, what message do you want people to gather from your paintings? Um, I just think it's really beautiful and that beach that I painted from has some emotional attachments to me because me and my family always go there and I just think it's really beautiful and really peaceful. What called you to paint a landscape rather than a portrait, still life, or something abstract? I originally, from the beginning, knew I wanted to paint a landscape because I think that I wanted to learn how to shade, like, nature, because it was, for me, it just seemed really interesting, and I thought I could make something really amazing. Thank you, Riley. It was beautiful. Zion. Hello. Can you speak a little louder, please? Is this better? Are you interested in becoming a firefighter? And if so, what appeals to you about it the most? Um, well, actually, I don't really plan on becoming a firefighter at all. I just kind of thought it was an interesting topic to learn about. And yeah, that's basically it. Can you tell us what you think are the most important qualities a person should have in order to become a firefighter? Well, you definitely have to be willing to save other people. I mean, it's not really for everyone. Um, and then you also have to show leadership too, especially if you want to become a higher rank, because that's definitely a quality that you'll need if you want to become like a lieutenant or a chief. Did you get to visit any fire departments? I did actually, and I got to ride in a fire truck, so that was pretty cool. Excellent, thank you. Hans. Okay. One trail looked like blacktop. Do you prefer that or dirt? Well, that, that was a pump track, actually. It's totally different from a trail. Um, that's it's like totally different, but I definitely prefer actual trails. 
And what kind of bike things do you bring with you when you ride? Um, well, I just got my bike, so I haven't really gotten a chance to get any tools, but I'm getting a multi-tool, which has a bunch of different stuff on it that you can use to repair your bike, and then a, a tire repair kit also. Who did the amazing videography for, of your trail riding? Um, I did most of it, and the ones where it's like me mountain biking, it's my mom filming. Thank you, Hans. CJ. Yes, Ms. Warren. Some martial arts include forms or repetitive movements to four directions, or AKA meditation in motion. Did you do any of these? Well, some of the beginning stages to the different techniques that I performed do have repetitive uh, like skills to them. For instance, you might block right, block left, and then grab the arm and then make that into an arm bar. And then another skill might have kind of the same blocking at the beginning. But all in all, uh, Madhur Do dives more into the meditation aspect of martial arts in the ninth skill, which is Qigong. And yeah, that's where it gets more like meditative sort of. Thank you, CJ. Olivia. Yes, Ms. Warren. After you finished your makeup portion of your eighth grade project, what inspired you to study tribal belly dance? Well, I thought it was really cool and I knew that Ms. Warren had done it before. So I guess I just did it because it was an opportunity and I didn't, at the time, I didn't meet with my makeup mentor enough so I had to switch and it just sounded really fun. Well it was. And what was one thing you learned from your experience? Um, belly dancing takes a lot of patience and you really have to build up core muscle. I was not ready. <laughs> Thank you Olivia. Emmett. Hi. I see that you chose to make your project from solid wood stock. How did you come to choose this material over plywood or some other materials in terms of their sustainability and differences in how you would work with them or finish them? Um, I chose the hardwood because I wanted an authentic, um, like I wanted to make it all one thing and not use substitutes as such as like plywood through the shelves and things, but I did, I am gonna add a piece of plywood on the back of it. But yeah, I just wanted an authentic, uh, solid cabinet. I can't wait to see you, see it after you've finished it. It looked really beautiful so far. Uh, Tom, what do you think, what, what do you think might be discovered about dark matter in the future? Well, like I said uh, in my presentation, that people think uh, dark matter is missing particles in the atom, and there are a lot of pretty smart people working on it, and they're actually trying to create it in a particle accelerator in Switzerland. Uh, it's where they also discovered the Higgs boson in 2012, which is a huge discovery, and I think that it's gonna help us a lot in explaining the universe as it is and what it will be and what it was. Thank you, Tom. And lastly, hi, Allie. Hi. What was the most difficult and most enjoyable dance move for you to learn? Um, the most difficult dance move to learn was probably a turn because of like the footwork and um, how your arms had to be placed and like putting it all together was just kind of difficult, but it's what I spent the most time on. And hmm, the most enjoyable one, I don't really have a favorite one. They were all pretty fun to learn because I had never done any of them in my life before, so. 
Also, who edited your video? Um, I actually edited my video and it took a total of at least four hours to make, which was obviously time consuming, but <clears throat> I, it was difficult to edit it because I had to line up the dance with the audio in the background, which took a lot of time. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, eighth grade, I'm, I'm very impressed with everything you did this year and very proud of you. Thank you for joining us for this question and answer session.